Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, I'm James Gabs. Um, I work at MCN. Uh, all of my stuff's going to be up on GitHub, including there's going to be some source code here at the end. Uh, probably won't get to all of it, so if you want to check it out, get a little ahead of game, you're welcome to do that. Um, today we're going to be talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and probably none of y'all's. Um, <laughs> monads. So uh, just out of curiosity. Not yet. Woo! Yes, hopefully. Um, so out of curiosity, who here is familiar with monads? It was a computer science term. I think I had a test on it once. Okay. Uh, hopefully we can rectify that a little bit. So first things first, uh, the big question, uh, what is a monad? So quick answer, um, I'm going to attempt a couple definitions here, but the first one is, uh, a monad is a monoid in the category of endomorphics. Yeah, monad. Yeah, that's, that's the most concise definition I can give, but it's not terribly illuminating. Um, so let's try a couple better ones. Uh, before I really get too into that, let me talk a little bit about why you should care about these things at all. Um, so really, and here's a, just a highly opinionated and completely unsubstantiated claim, um, but I think that choosing that the right abstraction when you're writing code is the difference between code that just works and code that is good. Um, and I, I, I have reasons for saying that. Um, if you have well-abstracted code, it's readable, right? you know what the objects you're talking about are describing, um, it's testable, right? you can small chunks, it's extensible, you have places to hook in, uh, because of all of those, it's maintainable, and it's elegant, right? It's actually kind of fun to read and work on. Um, you guys have all seen an example of this. Um, you may, at some point, have written some code that looks something like this. Um, it's some old PHP. It's all in line. It works, right? It does what it's supposed to do. Um, but hopefully these days we're all writing things that look more like this on the right, right? We have our credentials abstracted out somewhere so we can change them in place. We have a, an abstraction for users that you know, models an object, interacts with a database and separate out our presentation logic into the subtraction of a view. Um, I guess I'm sorry, that's the user at all. But, um, so we're separating out presentation and actually storage logic. Um, that's mm -hmm. all I just said. Uh, and similarly, I think we're seeing this shift in the front end a lot. We're moving from spaghettified jQuery to backbones with nicely encapsulated and abstracted objects. Um, so this is kind of a common pattern. And really, I think that's, that's the big value proposition of any sort of model view whatever framework, uh, right? It's identified a common set of problems, come up with a set of abstractions for solving them, and provide them to you so that you don't have to think about them again, and so that you can reuse that code all over the place. And I think our goal as software engineers should be to do the same thing, right? We should look for common patterns and you know, structures and write the right abstractions to solve them. Um, so let's think a little bit about code reuse. At a language level, we have a couple. I think the one that's probably most familiar to most people here is inheritance or subclassing. It's classic object oriented. Um, in Ruby, we have modules. You might have mix ins or some other concept that's something similar. Um, that's probably familiar to most people here. Uh, there are some other things. There's object composition. You may have heard of that as the decorator or presenter pattern. Um, how many people have worked in a functional language at some point? A number of you. Okay. So, um, some other ones you may be less familiar with are things like function composition. Um, and really, this is kind of where monads fit in. Um, this is loosely a spectrum uh, from kind of object-oriented techniques for reusing code down to really strongly functional ones. So if you've only worked in Ruby, you probably haven't had much reason to see monads. Um, whereas if you've probably been in Haskell, you can't help but see them. Uh, so, uh, and just to get straw poll here, uh, Haskell is? <laughs> that's my favorite, but I'm biased. Um, so for those of you that have no experience with functional programming, that's fine. Um, the basic idea with functional programs is you start with functions as sort of the primitive, I don't want to say object, because object means something, but I'm going to say object. Um, right? Instead of building up programs by specifying, you know, here's a user, here's what a user knows about, uh, you start with functions that are actions or behaviors. Um, and you build up your programs by combining these simple functions to get more complicated. Uh, really, the paradigm shift here is from verbs to nouns, or from nouns to verbs, rather. Uh, it's not, here's what a thing is, it's here's how things happen. Um, there's actually a really good article along that, but I'll link here at the end. Um, but yeah, so how does any of this relate to monads? Well, the thing about functional programming is it's all about functions and compositions. Well, mathematicians have been studying those for a long time, and there's a branch of mathematics specifically dedicated to that. 
um, category theory is the branch of math that starts with here's what a function is, here's what a composition is, what can we do with that? Um, and monads are an important object from category theory. Uh, these were studied a long time before functional programming was even a thing. Um, it just happens to be they fit in really nicely in functional programs. So you'll see them a lot in purely functional languages. Um, so I say this, and I mean this in a very real but also somewhat punny sense, that Haskell programs can't do anything without monads. Um, and pure functional languages often, like all of your interactions with I.O. or manipulating state, are all mediated through a monad. Um, and if that sounds like a pretty strong restriction, it is. But I think it is worth kind of playing around with these sorts of things. Um, here's a strongly opinionated quote that's not mine. Um, but a language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. Working in a functional language will definitely change the way you think about programming. So I'd recommend everybody try it at some point in time. Uh, it'll stretch your brain for sure. Um, again, if, so if you haven't seen any of these, that's totally fine. Uh, Ruby does actually have some constructs for doing fairly strongly functional looking things. Uh, hopefully this is fairly familiar to most people. Um, this is, you just have a list of numbers. Uh, you can map across it, squaring all of them. Just grab the ones that are bigger than 50 and then reduce all that down to the accumulator to sum it all up. Um, sort of a contrived example, but a basic one. Um, in a functional language, that might look something like this. Uh, this is Haskell, don't worry over really much about the syntax. But the basic idea is, you want to define a function, I'm gonna call it big square sum. And so if I want to find the big square sum of the list, uh, you read this right to left. You take the list, you map over it squaring everything, you filter it by comparing things to 50, and then you fold that all up by adding things all together. Um, that makes sense to everybody? Yes. Yes. Um, you can actually write this a little simpler as this. Um, essentially, the lists on both sides are redundant there. But I think this is actually a really important shift. It's not saying, I'm going to define a function by saying, here's what it does to value. So I'm going to say, here's a function. This function is, take this function, plug it into this function, plug it into this function. Um, that really is the thought shift when working functionally. It's we're building up complicated functions by composing smaller pieces that are simple and easy to understand. Um, that dot is literally mathematical functional composition. Um, so that actually that works out really nicely. Um, the reason that example chains together so well is because the types line up. I know we're not used to thinking about types, but I think this should make sense anyways. Um, this map square function is a function that takes in a list of integers and returns a list of integers. The filter function is another function that takes in a list of integers and returns a probably smaller list of integers again. And then the fold function takes in a list of integers and reduces it down to a single value that's the sum of all those things. But they all line up nicely end to end, right? I can chain them all up. And really, what I'm saying is that this composed function is, we'll just follow each of those zeros in turn. So they all compose immediately and everything's nice. The problem is, what if you aren't so lucky? And it turns out you're often not quite so lucky. Um, here's a, a fairly simple example of that. I'm going to define some slightly different functions, just map prime, filter prime, and full prime. They do exactly the same things as the functions that I talked about before, right? Mapping square, filtering. But they're also going to print some extra information as they go. Right? The map function tells you how many things you're squaring. The filter function prints out how many things it filtered down to, and so on. So, in a certain sense, these are doing the same thing, but not quite. Um, Haskell's pretty restrictive here in that the fact that these things are printing things out to the screen means that they aren't just returning an integer, they're returning an integer and printing things out to the screen. Um, and so that has to be reflected in the types. So my functions are not just returning a list of integers, they're returning an I.O. action and a list of integers. So, in the picture I have here, I've got these values, but when they come out, they're wrapped up in this extra context. Um, so I can't quite chain them all together. I'd really like to, though. It seems like it should be pretty trivial to do so. Um, and that's exactly what a monad gives us. Um, so let me attempt a second definition here. Um, so a monad is precisely the glue you need to bind these functions together and cross-compose. Uh, so it lets you fill in if you have this cross diagram, it essentially lets you lift these cross arrows and then follow the trail all the way across to get a composed function that does exactly what you'd expect there. Um, that sort of makes sense why this would be useful. Um, 
problem with this definition is that's way too vague to be useful. So let me narrow it down again. Um, so third and final definition. Uh, a monad is a certain kind of structure with two functions that are going to be important. Um, I'm going to call them pure and bind. You hear some different words for them, but these are fairly standard. Um, so the pure function, what it should do, and, and, and anytime I talk about a monad, I'm thinking of that as just being some extra context around the value. So what my pure function should do is just take an arbitrary value and wrap it up inside that extra context. Um, in the example we saw before, that was IO. Um, so pure just wraps it up in a trivial IO action. And then bind is really the interesting one. Bind says, give me a value that's already wrapped up in this context and another function that doesn't know how to take things that are in that context, and let me still feed it through and get the result. Right? That's really the ingredient that we want here when we're talking about these cross-compositions. A um, little bit of an asterisk there. I can't just take any functions. I need some that actually do anything. <coughs> so there are some laws that, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip. Um, but we essentially want to disallow things like this. Right? If we're binding a list, that should represent I'm feeding this list value through a function somehow. So my implementation couldn't possibly be, well, just ignore the list and return this completely different thing. That shouldn't work. Um, so there are just a few laws that specify that you can't do things like that. Um, here they are. I'm not going to cover them. Um, you can trust me in that the code that I'm going to write here later satisfies them. Uh, or you can verify it because there are specs to verify that. So we'll look at that later. Um, and the thing is, you are somewhat isolated from this in Ruby because you can just print stuff whenever you want and you don't have to worry about using one ads. Um, but they really do show up everywhere once you start to think to look for them. Um, right, the IO monad is a monad. Uh, there's do notation in Haskell, and that's where that joke comes from. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. Like lists, you can think of as a monad where a list of values represents a function that doesn't just return a single value, it returns, here's a whole bunch of possible values. So you can think of that as being kind of a non-deterministic computation context. Um, you can tweak that a little bit and get probabilistic computation where your functions return lists of values, each one attached with a certain probability of what you, uh, like the likelihood of you getting that value. And then the monad structure should be able to chain a whole bunch of those together without you having to think about it. Um, that can be fairly powerful. Um, another important one is maybe. That represents a function with the extra context of, well, maybe this function just failed. And I don't really have a result that makes any sense. Um, a whole bunch of others. Anything that manipulates a state um, in a pure functional programming language is going to be some sort of monad. Where it's a value, but it also sets a global variable or reads from a global variable or something to that effect. And similarly, anything that interacts with a database um, could be wrapped up inside a monad. So lots of things that you'll want to do all the time. Um, are really monads. Um, so that's a really quick high-level overview. I want to look at some code here. Um, but before I do, any questions? Cool. All right, so let's look at some Ruby code. Uh, um, from from the standpoint of this, how different is Haskell from Lisp? Um, I haven't done much Lisp. I've started looking into Clojure a little bit. Um, so Lisps seem to be a whole lot more permissive about like letting you modify state and not being nearly so purely functional and strongly typed. The bang operator, for yeah. instance. So yeah. Haskell is just really, really purely functional and forces you towards these sorts of things. Okay. Uh, they ease a pain point in Haskell that's very painful and kind of less painful in Lisp, so not quite. I guess from my memory, OCaml's related to Haskell? Uh, it is related somehow, but I've okay. never... Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, sorry, guys. Here's some Ruby code. Um, I'm going to look at a couple different monads. I felt really bad writing that a monad was a, an object. That just seems wrong. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to want to subclass it, so I'm going to do it anyways. It makes a certain amount of sense, though, right? A, a monad is a context wrapping of value. So I'm going to model that here as an object that just stores a value, and we'll do some stuff with it as we see. Um, like I said, a monad really needs to tell you two things. It needs to have a pure operation, which is just take this value and embed it in a pure context. And it needs to have a bind function. Pure is actually really simple, and often there's sort of a, a canonical implementation that works. 
Um, so if I'm talking about some specific monad class and I have a value when I wrap, want to wrap it up, well, if it's already wrapped up in the right type, cool, I'm done. If not, wrap it up in the type. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Again, bind is the really important one there. So we'll look at those uh, case by case. Um, I won't get into this too much, but there are some nice things to know about monads in that once you have a monad, you get some stuff for free. You get a thing that looks sort of like flattened for lists, and you get a thing that looks sort of like map for lists, entirely in terms of bind and pure. Um, but that's probably out of scope. So, um, so this is my base monad. I'm going to define a couple here. Let's take a look at list. Like I said, we can think of the list monad as representing non-deterministic computation, right? It's a function that returns lots of values that could be the answer. Um, so I'm going to tweak my default implementation a little bit here. If you have a single value and want to return a list of values that somehow still represents just that single value in this new context, um, there's sort of one obvious way to do it, and it's you return the list with just the one value in it. Right? It's technically non-deterministic, but you don't have a whole lot of options. Um, so that's the sensible implementation. Uh, bind is the interesting one. So let's think a little bit about what that should be. So the bind function should take a list of values of some type and a function that can take in individual values and return back lists of values and wrap that all up into giving me a list of values as output. Um, if you think about that a little bit, there's really only one way that makes sense to do it. Um, about all you can do is take this function and map it over each individual value. That will give you a list of lists, um, but we just want a list. So you want to either flatten that or just take each individual list and add them together. That's what that's doing. So right, it's um, uh, right. If we're binding in, so if we look at the wrapped value, um, iterate over that for each one, call the function that we're passing in on the value that gives us a list, um, and accumulate all of those. So this is essentially flat now. Um, like not a whole lot of that. Um, does that make sense why that's an appropriate implementation? Uh, I should, again, time permitting, I would cover monad laws. And if you're interested in looking at the source here, I do have um, the monad laws are represented as shared examples for each of these classes. Um, so you can verify that they do hold by firing up the specs. And we can just focus on list. specs and check that they do satisfy the laws. Um, but again, I'm cutting the time short here. Um, so that's the idea, right? We can take a function that only knows about single values, feed it through lists, and not have to worry about it. Uh, let's see an example why you might actually care to do that at some point in time. Um, so what I'm going to implement here is a script to show you how a knight moves around a chessboard. Um, so what this does is it takes the starting position and a number of moves and gives you what the board would look like after that many moves. So here we have a knight starting off at 2, 3 and taking zero moves, so he'd have to be right there. After one stage, he could end up in any of those places, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Um, after that, it kind of stops being interesting. Um, so let's take a look at the source here. So again, I'm just I'm reading in the starting positions and number of moves from standard in. Um, this draw function just draws the checkerboard. Uh, the one piece will be relevant here is I'm going to pass it in a list of uh, squares that should be marked and check if it includes the row and column I'm printing out. So here's the monad part. It's really easy to talk about if I'm at a square, I know exactly what square I'm at, where can I end up in the next move? Right? Um, a knight does an L-shaped move, so one in one direction, two in another, plus or minus. All of my combinations are right here. Um, I do want to limit that down. I mean, the chessboard's only eight by eight, so I want to filter that down. That, I can't move off the side of the board, um, so I'll only include the values that are actually inside the chessboard. But a single move is a function that takes position and returns the list of those that are available. Um, I'd like to chain those together without having to worry about, well, after one move, I don't really know where I am anymore. Um, and that's exactly what the bind function gives you. So the implementation here, once you have that machinery in place, is let's start off by saying we've reached the starting square. Right, just 
put that in a pure context. And then for however many steps we want to take, we just take our single move step and bind it through the stuff that we've reached so far. And that's the stuff that we've reached in the next stage. The Monad machine ring handles everything for you, and you get the result that you want just by drawing the stuff that you've reached. Um, so that's just a dead simple implementation. This is on GitHub, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I know I'm having a rush here. Um, yeah. So it's almost like the inverse of reduce, and then you're taking a single value and expanding it out. Well, it, it is in the context of the list monad because the list monad is all about expanding one value into a single value. Okay. Um, really, what it's about is managing these contexts. Uh, so if you have stuff with an extra context, it'll manage that context for you along the way. You know, you have these functions that have I/O operations. Well, it'll do the obvious thing of just print that, and then print that, and then print that, and make it so you don't have to think about it, right? All you have to say is, here's what a step is, now go compose it. So here, in the I.O. In the IO version, it's the printing, right? right? So here, you're saying that well, printing thing, or reading. Yeah, but so, I, so here, what's, what's the other thing? Is it the expansion? Yeah, it's the fact that my functions aren't taking a single value and returning a single value, my functions are taking a single value and returning a whole bunch of values, right? And and I start here, and I put it up in any of these places, possibly. So and the bind is the fact that not only are you calculating what, after one move you've got these squares, and then after the second iteration it's those squares based on those squares. Right. You've also got an I.O. Op operation as well. So that was your monad context was that you were, I'm using the wrong word, I know, but I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around math and I'm stupid. But the okay. point is, you, you've, got, you've got the two concerns. You've got the one where you're figuring out your position and you're passing that through the chain, which you're also right. dis displaying at the same time. I, I am, I'm not okay. using the I.O. monad here though. Um, Ruby lets me just draw things wherever I want. So right. I draw right. functions and press things up. So I'm not, the, the only monadic thing here is that chaining together of, I have functions that take in a single state and return a bunch of possible states that I could be in after that. But if there's just a true monad, then you would actually have a Yeah, if I were running this in Haskell, I would have two monads, one for managing the list compositions and one for actually printing stuff out. As opposed to a monad containing the two concerns, one of which was the mathematical movage part, and the other part was the, the I.O. bit. That's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Because the first thing that you said was the monad was you had this integer, 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 and you had this other I/O bit, and therefore you had this thing that kind of munged the two together and shoved them along. And I'm sure. So what is uh, the the issue here is I have a, a normal set of functions that would compose, like it, so. In the previous example, it was I had a function that you know, list of integers, list of integers, list of integers, list of integers. They all lined up. So that's the set of moves, right? Like the, in essence, you have a set of final positions that you keep passing in. Right. So I hope I'm not derailing you asking. No, it's, it's okay. Um, I was using list values there as non-monadic values, and that's the point of confusion. Um, okay, that's why I'm confused. Never so uh, this this example would be like that one in that if I had a bunch of functions that were, if I started this square, I end up in this square. If every time I have one square to one square, one square to one square, I, then I'm throwing a wrench in all of this by saying, well, I don't really know anymore. I'm starting at one square, and I could end up in any of those. That's the extra context. That's the, I'm taking IO action. Gotcha. Is this so, it? Now I can you know, take the single square to lots of squares, single square to lots of squares, and still chain them together. Got it. I'm lost. Are we observing re recursion in this algorithm? Uh, no, no recursion. No recursion. So it's just this. Same kind of. I mean, it's like, well, it's like unrolled. Okay. Kind of. I mean, I'm not explicitly calling. I'm well, resetting reach, but I'm not calling a function on the function itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of let me um, let me do another sort of similar example. Um, just to illustrate this a little further. Um, so, like I mentioned, uh, so you can think of that as being somewhat non-deterministic, but it's not like, you know, I, I have a 50% chance of doing this and a 50% chance of doing that. It's just here's all the possibilities. Um, this is a slight variation on that where I really do want to talk about probabilities and chaining those together. Um, so, uh, the probably context is going to represent, you know, I have values, but I have values with attached probabilities. Um, so if I just wanted to say, you know, single value always happens, that would be value with probability one. That's the pure context. Um, and uh, don't worry too much about this. Uh, if I want to bind a function through <coughs> this, um, I'm essentially leaning on the fact that uh, if you have two events with certain probabilities and you want to know the event, the probability that one happens and the other happens, it's the product of those two. Um, yeah, so right, uh, if we have a wrapped up value, that'll be a hash of you know heads with 50%, tails with 50%. Um, 
if I want to pass in a function through there, I can look at what that function would do to each of the possible places that I'm already at. Right? My functions don't know anything about probabilities and just know, you know, pass, like here's what has happened. Um, then if I want to chain those together, the chain probability is a product of the two probabilities. That's essentially what that's saying. Um, so let's see that in a script. So I can use the list monad to make it really easy to chain together a whole bunch of coin flips. Um, if I'm thinking functionally about a coin, uh, a coin is a function that takes in the entire history of the universe up to a point in time, and then returns a head or a tails with some probability. Um, most of the coins you've encountered do 50-50 heads or tails, um, but at some point in history that coin was loaded, it may come up a little bit different. Um, so I've implemented a couple coins here of varying degrees of realism. Um, so you can see, like, a conventional 50-50 fair coin, a load coin, slightly more likely to land on heads, uh, tails never fails one. Um, and then some that actually inspect their history um, and do the opposite of that or kind of vote on whatever's winning so far and continue that trend. Um, so a question might be, you know, given a whole bunch of these coins, how can I flip them and then what's the likelihood of the various outcomes from all of that? Um, so as you see, a coin here, given a particular way of flipping it, um, just you know, focus on fair, maybe. Um, if I want to flip a coin, I'm going to look at the entire history, um, call my flipping strategy on the history. So for this one, it would just be half heads, half tails. And extend my history with whatever result I got with whatever probability I had of getting that attached result. So uh, for instance, if you were to flip a fair coin when your history was heads, comma, tails, then you should have a 50-50 chance of, you know, 50% chance of getting heads, tails, heads, and 50% of getting heads, tails, tails. Um, that much makes sense? Yeah, no problem. Cool. All right, well, that's it. Um, so let's say I wanted to chain a whole bunch of these together. The problem is coins just look at history. It's deterministic. It's these are the things that have happened. But they return this fuzzy superposition of, well, this thing might happen, this thing might happen, and here are my confidences of all of those. Um, so if I want to chain that together, all of that is wrapped up inside the probably gonad. Right? The probably gonad is the only thing that needs to know about probability. To flip a sequence of coins, I can just grab the first one and call it as a function that flips it. And then iterate over the rest of the sequence, taking my result so far, so that's a probably distribution and my coin, and then binding the result through the function. So that's going to flip it on each one and then do the monad magic of gluing that all together for you. Um, and that's it. My result is whatever I end up with as a probability distribution at the end there. Um, so as you see, like once you get past the conceptual overhead of monad, implementations using it can be really, really short. Um, let's try that one out. Uh, okay, so I, I, this just loads in everything you've seen so far and then halts so I can play around with this. So let's try flipping uh, three fair coins. Um, <coughs> sorry, cool. um, sorry, bear with me on that one. Uh, so as you can see, not a whole lot exciting there. They're all evenly weighted, so we're going to get each possibility with equal probability. Um, I did implement a little helper function to make this a little easier to read. Um, so let's call that R and find the odds that the sequence of events that we got had uh, at least one tails. So 50-50 shot of us getting at least one tails in three coin tosses. Um, let's compare that with some other stuff. Uh, it would be interesting here. So if we try, um, well, a loaded coin first. Remember, a loaded coin is weighted towards heads. Um, so if I flip that followed by two fair coins and ask what the probability of getting at least one tails is, it's less than 50%. That makes sense. Um, what do you think should happen if I try a loaded and then a balancing and then a fair? So remember balancing kind of counterbalances whatever happened last. Um, it's got a 25% chance of doing whatever happened last time and a 75% chance of doing the opposite of that. 
Uh, not quite 50, because it doesn't completely counterbalance. But So the first one is weighted towards heads. The second one should be then weighted towards tails. So this should be a little better than 0.45, but not quite 0.5. Um, and that checks. So you can play around with this. But uh, again, all of the complicated logic about, well, how do you compose these things that don't give us exact states, but give us distributions, that again is just all wrapped up in one. Um, OK, that's the hardest one. Um, any questions there? All right, I have a couple other questions. Code. Yeah. Um, in the code, uh, if you go back to the code on like line 11, there's that capital C coin and then passing it. Right, so um, I want to, like, each coin has a different flipping strategy, um, and it's essentially going to be I'm going to take the history I've seen so far and apply that strategy to it. So I'm passing in the strategy as this flip block. Um, don't get hung up on the capital C. I just I was thinking of it like an object, so I felt like I should have a capital there. Uh, that's not significant in any way. Um, it is a little weird that what that is returning is a function, but this is a very functional thing, so that's the right thing to do there. Any other questions? Okay, um, let me do a couple other toy examples here. Um, one of my favorite ones, and I think one of the most important monads really, is the maybe monad. Um, like I mentioned, this represents well, you could have a value in it, but somewhere along the way your computation could have failed. Um, and that's fine, it'll just be nothing. Uh, but you can still chain all those things together and not have to worry about handling failure along every step of the way. Um, that's a really useful thing when you have... Um, if this is really functional programming's method of exception handling in a lot of cases. Um, so I'm going to define this special value that just represents... Uh, I don't have an answer, it's just failed. Um, so that's failed. Uh, and then... My bind function is dead simple. Um, I have a value, I want to pass it through a function. Well, just call the function on it. If that returns something, great, I'm done. I have a maybe. Uh, if not, then whatever else happened, I don't care. I'm just going to return this value that represents, hey, something went wrong. Um, so that's pretty simple. Uh, but the nice thing is, and you've sort of seen this already, but I haven't made it explicit. Um, when you have these monads, the way that you compose things is always by staying inside the monad. Sort of what happens in the monad stays in the monad. Um, and so in this case, we're guaranteed that at every step along the way, uh, we're going to stay inside this maybe monad, and when you try and call a function on it, it can fail gracefully. Um, so I'm going to do something here um, and just define a whole bunch of methods on my wrapper. Right? This maybe is just an extra wrapper and a value. Uh, and so I'm going to do a method missing here, uh, where if I try and call any method on this wrapper, it just sends it on through to the thing that's wrapping, but does it bound up inside this context uh, of the monad? Um, so that'll let things fail, and if it fails, it'll just essentially rescue it and give me back a failure value. Um, here's why that could be useful. Uh, so let's... Uh, this is probably a problem you guys have run into before. Um, you have a hash. It might be deeply nested. Um, so... Oftentimes you can, I mean, if you have nested accessors there, you're fine. Um, but then the problem comes when you don't really know exactly what the structure is, um, and somewhere along the way it's nil, and then you try a method that's not defined on nil, and everything blows up in your face. Um, so you guys have probably mitigated this with something like and and, or, uh, well, the and and plugin, or uh, you know, something like that. But that gets really unwieldy after a while if it's deeply nested. <laughs> Probably is a good reason for not deeply nesting things. Um, but here's another way around that. Um, let me wrap this thing up in a maybe. Um, so all of my methods are just method missing defined to the thing that I'm wrapping. So I can still take this and access stuff on it. Um, at any point along the way, I can check and see if my computation failed. It didn't. And since it didn't, I know I can extract a value from it. Um, but the nice thing is, if I have, and it, I mean, nothing particularly important about hashes here. Um, you know, I can do that and then find the length of that array and then, yeah, whatever. Um, but if I try and take this wrap value and call things that failed, well, that'll fail. If I try and call a function on failed, it'll fail. So I can chain as many of these together as I want, and then when I'm done, I check and see if it's failed. It is. Oh, or you could just extract the value and just get back nil then and not have to worry about handling it along the way. So it's a good way of propagating failure forward to the point that you actually want to deal with it. 
Um, again, if you have rescue blocks and everything, that's not hugely important. But if you're in a strongly functional paradigm, that becomes really essential. It's also great for getting rid of mail. Um, <clears throat> so, so is this the same as like a promise in a, in a JavaScript library? Not really sure. I haven't. Uh, uh, okay. uh, promise so JavaScript or is that a framework? Like that's the point. Like no, that's true. Yeah. Right. Like you'll wait for an answer to eventually show up. Yeah. Okay. I guess it has the same failure semantics yeah. as you can chain them. Right. Okay. Um, I should mention if you're interested in this sort of thing, there actually is a gem that drops this stuff in um, and is pretty nice to use and way more robust than my method missing implementation. So please use that if you like this. Uh, yeah. uh, I have it in the notes. Yeah, monadic, appropriately. Um, yeah, but it's in the source code, so feel free to grab it there. Um, I actually might be like that. Uh, slight variation on that that I did. Uh, so this was maybe I did one called um, questionably, because this is probably a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> same idea here. All I'm going to use the monad for is the fact that things chain, chain together and stay inside the monad. Um, think of this like a development helper. Um, this gives you a wrapper around a function, or around an object that gives you some extra power to inspect it, essentially. If you have pride, you don't need this. Um, so what this is going to do, same idea. Uh, if I try and call a method on my wrapped value, it's going to do some stuff to the, stuff to the inner value, but it will bind it through. So I'm ensured that things always stay inside this monad. Um, what it's going to do is if I try and call a function, it's going to send it to the wrapped value. Um, one important thing to know about send is that it doesn't respect private methods. Um, so you can get two things that are private and you shouldn't be able to get two if they're wrapped up. Um, and if that fails, because I don't have a method, then it'll fall back on trying to grab an instance variable, which again, you shouldn't be able to get to, so don't ever use this in production. Um, but it, you know, it, it shows you kind of some extra introspection power. Um, so here's just a really dead simple example. I have a foo class that takes in some options and stores them in, a, in a, an instance variable has a private method that lets you grab a secret out of it. Um, and even if I have another class that references that original class, um, I can use these monads to wrap them up and use them conveniently. Um, so let's do... Oh, well, I should first say So if I have my bar, I call bar.foo, that gives me a foo, but foo is kind of clandestine. Um, doesn't tell me much about it. Uh, if I try to get, what was it, secret? If I try to get secret out of there, nothing doing. Um, also, ops. Denied. Yeah, no go. But uh, if I do questionably and wrap that up. Uh, <laughs> so I have a wrapped value there. Now, when I call foo on that, I'll get, again, a wrapped value, uh, which sort of changes the semantics of what dispatching a method to it does. Um, so now, if I do foo.secret, it is still wrapped in the monad, as we'd expect, but I have access to the value, and I actually could get it all the way out if I wanted to, in this case. Um, it's a good steal. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I can even get the whole options that are stored as an instance variable, things like that. Um, so that, again, don't use that in production, that's a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> but I am thinking about something, that, uh, a problem that I've run into... Um, I'm trying to use more decorators, and a lot of times I'll use decorators for doing things like serialization, um, and have often run into the case where I want to serialize like a model that has some children, and I'll want to then serialize the children. So really, when I have a serialization decorator and access children, I would like to get the children wrapped up in, again, a serialization decorator of some sort. And that feels an awful lot like this. I haven't implemented that yet, but this seems sort of like the right pattern for approaching that sort of problem. Um, so if I ever write something there, I'm going to get home. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, questions on that one? All right, so that's a whirlwind tour, uh, but it is getting kind of late here. So um, I think I'll mention there are, there are a few more things in the uh, examples. There's the specs, the monad laws, and kind of walk through that. Um, if you are interested in this stuff, Um, I guess a couple of the big takeaways here. Um, monads, essentially what they are, uh, all myriad of metaphors aside, um, it's a different kind of composition. It's essentially a cross-composition that manages 
state, history, side effects, whatever sort of extra context you want to represent around computation. Um, and the other big takeaway that I hope you guys are somewhat interested in, in this stuff and uh, inclined to go look at some functional programming languages. Uh, and if you are, functional programming is cool, category theory is cool, and they are even cooler together. Um, if you were interested in any of that stuff, I would be glad to explain to you why a monad is a monoid in the category of the functors, but that's probably a little out of scope. Um, but, you know, come talk to me at the bar after if you are curious. Um, If you're curious about that verbs versus noun distinction and thinking about functional programming, that's a great write-up of it. Uh, and Haskell in particular, Learn You in Haskell, is a wonderful reference for getting started there. Um, in fact, the night score example came from a uh, modified version of an example on that. Um, also a point of personal privilege, uh, I work at MCM. We are hiring, um, although we are hiring for jobs for people. So if you hated all this and never want to think about it, cool, you can still come work for us. Uh, you won't have to, I'll do all that. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. <laughs>